shoulders, fists like rocks, bad fight picks like broken clocks, hands like lead, crushing weight, look online, it's always late, step up down to the show with skills are the key, terrific analysis with the capital T, Carlos says he's now brings insights to plea, from those three HBO shows that he's seen, film match classy lines keep the show cohesive, although he wants to turn on fires into adhesive, so if you're looking for a podcast that gets in your face, you bring yourself down to the heaviest place Where the blowers blow and the slicks just a slip So if you came here for the final points of face punching Then suck my team What up, bitches? And welcome to the new, even heavier, heavy hands I'm your host, as always, Connor Rebush, Joined by my intrepid host, P-Mac Yo, 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 what it is? <laughs> we heard your comments. We heard your criticisms. People were saying, heavy hands is for pussies. The show's too soft. It doesn't fit with the, the, the vibe of MMA. Well, guess what, bitch? Suck my dick. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the new Heavy Hands, and we are honored to uh, we are honored to inaugurate this new direction for the show, this new era, with a very special guest straight out of Columbus, Ohio, Miguel Class. Miguel, make some noise. Oh, I'm happy to be here, the most hardcore MMA analyst in the Midwest. <laughs> what the fuck? I'm from the Midwest. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds you're like from you the just South. He just stepped to you, Connor. We got beef straight up on the newest edition of the new Heavy Hands. Uh, okay, this is the part where I we... I can't let you get close. <laughs> Good <laughs> reference. This is the part where we awkwardly drop the bit. <laughs> We're talking about UFC 300 today, folks. That's why the special occasion warranted a very special intro. And um, UFC 300 is uh, well and truly... A completely stacked card. It's all interesting fights. Uh, it's all fighters whose names I recognize. I'm not looking at the Wikipedia page because I'm not Zane Simon. I don't use the Wikipedia. But if I was and I did, it'd be blue names across the board. Uh, we're talking notable fighters. We're talking title fights. Um, we're talking having perhaps the least compelling. <laughs> And interesting fight right at the top. Classic UFC style, baby. And, uh, yeah. Are you guys looking forward to this event? Miguel? Yeah, of course. I think the UFC, at least in the last two pay-per-views, has sort of put all their eggs in one basket. And that leads to, like, two nights of really cool fights and then a bunch of shit in between. But... This is going to be exciting. There's lots of things, and there'll be plenty to talk about afterwards, and there's plenty to think about ahead of time, even if some of it is just kind of like going to be sloppy, probably, or fights determined by people's glaring weaknesses, as MMA often is, but it's still interesting. It's undeniably interesting. And I'm actually going to, not to make this a whole talk about the UFC's matchmaking and their uh, extremely lumpy schedule, I've come to, to feel that it's actually like giving them a pass to say that the strength of pay-per-views like this are responsible for how shitty the Apex events are. <laughs> Good point. I don't think that's it. I just think they just don't try with the matchmaking. I think they just are like, who's cheap? Who's available? That's why they're bringing in all these contender series fighters. So many of those Apex cards, you, there will be fighters you care about. You know, like there will usually be like five or six guys you know, and they will be in a matchup that means nothing and does nothing and that you just don't care about. Yep. Uh, so it's not UFC 300's fault. We can get something like a UFC 300 and still get decent, solid fight night events. We used to. It wasn't that long ago. <laughs> it used to kind of be the norm. Um, so, but all that aside, I would, I would, I would say that UFC 300 is definitely not the norm. There are a few. No, 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 no. There are no. definitely a few times when the the UFC has very deliberately tried to put all its eggs in one basket For and sure. to make the best pay-per-view it possibly can. They absolutely uh, did pull out all the stops, but they used to have a respectable pay-per-view 
in the same month as two solid fight night cards. You know, that, that used to be normal. Uh huh. Um, yes. But all that aside, UFC 300 is very good and I'm excited to talk about it. Phil, P Mac, you hyped, bro? I am. Like, this is one where I think there's lots of different things to be excited about. It's got pretty much something for everyone. It's got old men fighting. It's got, like, it's got fighters, relevant fighters from pretty much every single weight class of you. Well, lots of different weight classes anyway, all the way up to, like, heavyweight. Um, And I think the main card is pretty much all going to be bangers. Mm -hmm. I think with the possible exception that Zhang Weili really likes wrestling now, but he, uh, even then uh, it'll still be pretty violent wrestling. Like it's going to be a really good main card. Uh, the fight, the fights which might be boring or weird have been, I'll lower down the card, namely Holly Holm, Kayla Harrison. And uh, yeah, it's, I mean, I mean, it starts off with Davidson Figueroa versus Cody Garbrandt. I mean, that yeah, pretty impressive. Yeah. So let's uh, let's go ahead and uh, get into it. The main event: a light heavyweight title fight between uh, Alex Pereira and Jamal Hill, former UFC light heavyweight champion. Not many people know that. <laughs> mm-hmm. Jamal Hill used to be the champion of this division. Um. And like I said, uh, I, I think honestly, if you look at this entire main card, excluding the Bo Nickel fight, the latest, here's a guy we're trying to push for no particular reason. Um, aside from that, this is actually like the least conceptually interesting fight to talk about, unfortunately, which is not to say yeah. that it will not be awesome to watch and fun. It's always cool to see Alex Pereira fight. Uh, Jamal Hill hits really hard and is big, so that in and of itself will make for an interesting test, and he will almost certainly find some moments to generate some serious excitement. Um, so it's not going to be bad. It's just that uh, there's really only one way to talk about this fight, which is like, how could it go wrong for Alex Pereira? Because it... Am I alone in this, boys? It feels like his fight to lose. Only you sort of. All right. Oh, interesting. Miguel's got a dissenting opinion. That's okay. We've we've got some heat already on the uh, UFC 300 main event. Uh, it's not that spicy. I mean, it's basically like it's a light heavyweight fight, so you cannot really say anything definitive about it. It can be a total yeah. shit show. It could turn up. Not like we expect at all. It could just be a shitty grappling fight. We like really have no idea what the floor is for a light heavyweight fight. We've never seen it. Um, I feel like I've seen the floor a few times. <laughs> <laughs> but then there's always one that goes lower. But no, I, I, I think generally, yeah, the, this is Pereira's fight to lose for sure. Like if you just watched these two guys, um, even just shadow box or something like that, you'd be and and knowing their games and how they like to get things done, it would be very hard to imagine that Hill can win in any way except for just you know getting a really one nice shot essentially, or you know a string of maybe some. It, it's hard because Pereira is vulnerable, so it's it's not yeah, like it thing. is unimaginable that Hill catches him with something. That's the thing, is that Pereira is not a great defensive fighter. Um, sometimes he's not as bad as advertised, but he really just doesn't seem to think about defense that much. Uh, fights with a very low guard, stands very tall, gets kind of lazy with his defensive footwork, um, and also when he's on the attack, can get completely zeroed in on landing shots and just forget about his defense. And he's not impossible to knock out. And Jamal Hill has long reach. He's a big guy, and he hits really hard. So, that, like I said, that that's enough reason to think that there will be some excitement and some genuine competitiveness in this fight, despite the fact that Alex Pereira, in every other respect, is a vastly superior technical kickboxer. Um, and the fact that Jamal Hill doesn't really wrestle. So 
you know, barring something strange happening, somebody catching a kick, somebody slipping, um, we're probably in for a good bit of MMA kickboxing here. So, Miguel, I saw a tweet that you posted. Oh, man. <laughs> Many people did. <laughs> Many people did. Many people with extremely Unfortunately. informed opinions. <laughs> Yeah, uh, it was a it was a great little piece of footage, which was just Jamal Hill's feet. Um, and uh, was that from the Teixeira fight? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, what round was that from? People were asking. I'm pretty sure it's round three. I'd have to go back and double check, but people are like, "This must be round five. I'm like, "Well, you could probably find this at any point in the fight, honestly." Yeah. I mean. More often than not, when you get a, you find a clip like that, it's because this is the first time the cameraman bothered to show their feet. It's not because right. of yeah, yeah, exactly. Also, it's like I mean, look at Usyk in round twelve or something like that. It's not like he right. looks like that. Right. I mean, we're gonna have we're gonna talk about Max Holloway and Justin exactly. Gaethje on this card. Look at look at Max Holloway's footwork in round five. It's not that bad. I mean, or even Pereira. I mean, in this yeah, fight, yeah, like yeah. Pereira get got really tired in some of his later, like at least with the first Adesanya fight. Yeah. Held it together, probably had one of his more uh, technical periods of the fight at like the end of round four going into round five. It was looking yep. quite, quite sharp and, and technically sound. Similar thing against Blovitz in round three at Salt Lake City at elevation. So it's yep. not it's not a given that somebody who's 205 pounds is just going to have footwork that totally collapses. Yeah, and I don't think there's much to collapse is is the point I'm trying to make. Um, what this clip showed yeah. was just Jamal Hill moving around. Um, and uh, I don't think this man's ever had any boxing instruction. If he has, right. it's uh, whoever taught Deontay Wilder how to move his feet. His, his footwork is <laughs> it's worse than Deontay Wilder's on a good night. It's slightly worse than Deontay Wilder's on a bad night. Uh, to me, it is one of the strongest contrasts between him and Pereira. Jamal Hill is very flat-footed. He crosses his feet routinely. He drags his rear foot behind him when he throws his rear hand. He, I mean, to me, one of the worst things to see is he rocks back on the heel of his front mm -hmm. foot. That just bothers me. Do not, never, that heel just shouldn't touch the ground. I'm sorry. Um, There's a point at the end of the clip, which like just gets cut off because the camera angle changes and you don't see the feet anymore. But essentially what he does is usually talk about fighters crossing their feet, especially moving laterally. They'll move the back leg first. Like if you're an orthodox and you're moving to the left and maybe you step with the rear leg first and your feet get crossed up or, or sort of end up on a line for a second and then yeah. you bring the lead leg out. But like he literally brings his rear leg forward and then in front of his lead leg and crosses yeah. it it's like it's i don't know it's like he's gonna do a pirouette or something yeah it's like <laughs> it's like irish step dancing uh <laughs> it's he is a he is a very very let's say intuitive striker because everything he does that's must, a nice way to put it everything he does in there must be pure intuition given that the the technical foundation of his entire striking game his footwork is that um, and I can confirm for any of the, uh, you know, people who were, uh, had just drunk half a bottle of cough syrup who were replying to Miguel's tweet. I can, <laughs> and they were suspicious about this. I can confirm his footwork is always like that, pretty much. Which isn't to say there aren't good moments. There are times when Jamal Hill is getting pressed and he keeps, he, you know, s sort of pivots and, Sort of keeps his jab in line and, you know, changes angles the way you're supposed to. When he's punching, the footwork is an afterthought at best. Um, which seems not only like a great way to walk into a devastating counter from Alex Pereira, but also suggests that he's really going to struggle to deal with Pereira's new favorite weapon, the low calf kicks. Right, yeah. Yeah. So. What do you think about um, the fact that it's – I well, I was thinking he'll probably try and fight in Southpaw a lot in this fight um, to try and take away the lead leg low kick of Pereira yeah. a bit. But 
when I was rewatching some of uh, Pereira's first fight with Adesanya in MMA, Adesanya was in Southpaw a lot, and Pereira would just do either like the step up lead leg low kick. Or just throw his lead leg, you know, mm-hmm. uh, without stepping up. Or just throw his rear leg to the body or to the head. So I don't know if if that really makes it easy. And essentially, it doesn't matter if you bring your feet together, like, every three seconds, what stance you're in. You're still going to be vulnerable to the kick. Sure. No, I think uh, Pereira is comfortable enough. Like Justin Gaethje, that man will do a lead leg out uh, low kick on a southpaw and land it a lot. Um, I don't really think that's going to... I, I think this is what happens when you try to do an MMA style overcorrection against somebody who is actually a kickboxer. Yep. They're just like, okay. I'll- also, I'm assuming he's just going to like drift over to the left and just left hook hill a whole bunch. Probably. I mean, this is the thing is, uh, it, it, Jamal Hill probably wouldn't look that much worse in Southpaw. You know? <laughs> That's that's the he fought. I think he fought. Um, I can't remember which fight it was. Maybe it was Tiago Santos or um, one of those fights. He fought a lot in Southpaw. So I think, and it's yeah, it's it's one of those things where since he doesn't have good mechanics and orthodox yeah, or either stance, it doesn't much. really matter all that much. <laughs> He's making it up as he goes along anyway, so it doesn't really make a huge difference like it would with some fighters. Yeah, half the time he falls forward into the other stance anyways when he throws his rear hand. Right. So he's a, he's practically a southpaw already. Um, Phil, your thoughts on the fight? I mean, so in its in its totality, we're we're describing a fight very much like Alex Pereira's last one. Yep, which was against Yuri Prochaska, where we're like, well, this guy isn't very good, but. He does have physicality, and he does have power. Uh, but, like, every other element of Hill's game seems less well-tuned, or, uh, like, multiple elements of Hill's game seem less well-tuned to handle uh, Pereira than uh, Prochaska was. As you said, he's he's super flat-footed, like... And Pereira is quite defensively vulnerable, but um, he's still, you know, Pereira is still relatively difficult to hit in pocket exchanges. It's mostly easiest to hit when he's being chased down. And Prochaska at least does, like, explode through space and was able to hurt him badly. Not going to happen with Hill. Um... I mean, it might, you know, he, he, he'll step in with, as you said, sort of shifting one, two, now and again, but it's, he's just not what he does. Um, same thing kind of goes for the wrestling. I mean, in many ways, like, Hill is a more, more, you know, complete MMA fighter than Yuri Prochaska, but not in ways that matter for this, but seem to matter for this particular matchup because I'm, I don't think I've ever seen him shoot for a takedown. No, I think somebody was saying, and in terms of official UFC stats, he's never shot for a takedown in his UFC career. Yeah, I mean, I think mm-hmm. the uh, I, he was on top of Paul Craig. I think Craig might have pulled guard. I'm pretty sure Craig pulled guard. And then, um, Tiago Santos, he might have like caught a kick and just kind of ran him down, if I can recall correctly. Uh, you know, I, I just don't, I mean, Jamal Hill is like a perfect MMA fighter because I just do, doesn't appear to have any like technical stylistic base at all. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He's like, I mean, a- again, we said the same thing about Yuri, but like Yuri at least has stylistic elements that I felt could like trouble Pereira. Yeah. Whether he, whether it's his background or not, I'm not sure, but Yuri's clearly into karate. <laughs> you know, yeah. he clearly thinks it's really cool. Oh yeah, it is. It is his background. That's why he started. Yeah, that. I mean, that makes sense. You know, you can see elements of that. You can see it in his timing and in his footwork. Uh, you can see it in how he uh, he finds those long lunging shots. Maybe doesn't lead to go a cohesive game, but Jamal Hill doesn't have any of those hallmarks. He just looks like looks like a guy who walked into an MMA gym. And could probably already just hit really hard. And that was kind of the basis 
of uh, what they, you know, sort of built the rest of his game around. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's been remarkably yeah. successful given all these horrible things we've just said about him. Well, I mean, that's the thing is that I, I, I think he has a he has a gift that, despite you know the Craig submission and all that kind of stuff, he has a natural feel for grappling uh, that allows him a bit more safety than some other fighters. Yeah. You know, that's what allowed him to crush Glover fairly effectively, whereas Yuri had and you know had yeah. to pull. Pulling out of his ass after an, a horrific war. So yeah, I mean, it just is the 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 thing is that his game is built to keep him. It's built on the understanding that he's the best striker in the world, <laughs> and that everyone's going to want to take him down. And yeah, uh, I think I, I think the not true. <laughs> it it is sort of like interesting because this like in, instinctiveness to Hill's fighting is. It actually is a bit of a weapon. Like, he doesn't do anything right, but sometimes he has right ideas. And you see that a lot with MMA fighters where things are sort of based off of just, like, having an idea and not having the right technique to do it. So it's like he will throw a lead left hook counter when somebody overextends, but the way he throws his lead hook is so bad where he brings it all the way down to his hip and... His shoulder looks like it's hyperextending. It lo- literally looks like it would hurt your shoulder to throw it that way. But it's like it's sort of effective because just a lot of MMA fighters don't even like try to counter um, in the pocket that way. So he can catch people that way. And yeah, just like the the size and athleticism make a big difference there too. And youth makes a big difference in this division that he's like relatively young for some people, still sort of fresh. I don't know. He, I mean, everything he does is technically bad, but he can still get some things done. Yeah, great finishing instinct as well. I was gonna say. Um, yeah. I was gonna say for all we know, he's he... got someone hurt. Yeah. Please, Phil, go on. Sorry. I was just gonna say, yeah. Whenever he's got someone hurt, always pulls it on. Um, doesn't let people back up off the cage. Like mixes up his shots whilst he's doing it. And again, this is stuff that you could sort of feasibly see happening in some version of a Pereira fight. Yeah. Yeah. Like, Pereira is not, you know, invulnerable to getting backed up into the cage and hurt, again, Francesca. But, you know, I, I, it's impossible to pick it actually happening. Right, yeah. I, I can't, I can, there's no part of me that would ever be like, I think there is above a 50% chance of this, of this happening and leading to a finish. No, Pereira's got better technique across the board, but he gets lazy. He just, mm-hmm. like, yep. decides not to care about doing everything perfectly in basically every fight there will be a period where he's just like yeah just kind of takes his eye off the ball um yeah i was i was going to say uh for all we know he did injure himself throwing his goofy punches jamal hill and i found out looking at the wikipedia did you guys know that the injury that caused him to vacate the title (laughs) was an achilles tendon injury in a ufc fighter basketball game yep yep Ooh, no i didn't they made him do that shit for International Fight Week, and then they made him vacate. Yep, exactly. Come, come on, man. I mean, you got to feel bad for him at least it, for the circumstances of all that. But I do. I don't I, know. I still feel bad for him, and I also feel like he got absolutely suckered, like Sean Strickland, who's now mad because he became champion and like it has not warranted like high paydays or whatever. Like, right. Everybody's slowly finding out that being a company man doesn't actually really reward you as much as you're worth. Uh, hey, Jamal Hill gets another title shot, I guess. That's what he gets for, uh, yeah, that's true. Kindly vacating the titles. Now he gets to fight a vastly superior kickboxer for the title. Yeah. After coming back from a terrible injury to have to tear your Achilles tendon, now you have to fight some guy who's just going to kick you there. Yeah. What's going to happen to his footwork? (laughs) Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, the thing is, maybe he's going to be like Kevin Holland. And maybe this will have fixed its footwork. That would be great. And yeah, he's gonna, he's gonna come out, and he's just gonna be, it's just gonna be Jose Aldo in there. He's had to relearn everything from scratch in order to come back. Yeah, wrong. It, it's not gonna happen. But. Right, right idea, wrong execution is a thing we say a lot about fighters. Um, it's rare you have a fighter for whom that seems to describe every single aspect of his game. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. That is the thing with Jamal Hill. It's not that he isn't dangerous. It's not that he doesn't have an idea how to use his reach. It's not that he doesn't know how to like time a counter. He has a ton of right ideas. Yeah. Uh, like again, look at his record. Like the man is objectively a good fighter, but every single technical aspect is just like he had to invent how to do this himself. Nobody taught yeah. him how to stand, how to throw a punch, anything. It is everything is full of technical holes. Um, so that's why I say, despite the fact I'm sure there will be some excitement, I don't think Jamal Hill is going to get like beaten up a little bit and then lay down, and I don't think Pereira is going to beat him up so comprehensively that he doesn't have one of those moments where he just kind of drifts out of the fight and lets Jamal Hill walk after him and ends up with his back against the cage. Mm-hmm. But the reason I said it was so easy is so uninteresting, despite all the discussion we've gotten out of it, is that uh, like you just have to pick Pineda, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. This... I mean, I watched Hill in his you know baton passing fight with OSP as like the other self taught plotter of the division. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, it's. It's Pereira sort of, it's it's Hill sort of chasing OSP round the cage and OSP very slowly plodding away and hitting uh, Hill with every left hook he throws, which isn't admittedly many of them. This is a very old and washed OSP by this point. But yeah, I just thought, what if that was OS, what if instead of OSP that was someone good? Yeah. Well, that's it. All three of us picking Alex Pereira. I am sure we will not be alone in the fight picking world for this one. After this, another title fight. Wei Li Zhang defends the UFC strawweight title against Yan Shaonan. Also on this card, I suppose I didn't really tell you all the fights we're going to be talking about at the top. We have the BMF title, a real thing that Mm. everybody cares about. More interesting than that are the two men fighting for it. Justin Gaethje and Max Holloway, Holloway's second foray into the lightweight division after the ill-fated effort against Dustin Poirier a few years ago. That is, I think, everybody's favorite fight on the card. An absolute pure action banger just for kicks. Um, we're going to talk about that. Also, Charles Oliveira, Armand Sarukian, elsewhere on the card, which we may discuss in a bonus episode up on the Heavy Hands Patreon. We have Yuri Puchaska. Versus Alexander Rakic, probably deciding the next light heavyweight challenge there. And Calvin Cater, Aljamain Sterling. If you want to hear me and Phil talk about two of the other interesting prelim fights, Jalen Turner, Hanata Moicano, and Davis and Figueredo, Cody Garbrandt, you should go back and listen to the tail end of last week's episode because we already discussed those. But Wei Li Zhang, Yan Shaonan after this. Hey everybody, thanks for listening to this week's Heavy Hands. If you like what you hear, please consider to support the podcast on Patreon. Patreon is basically continuous crowd f***ing. You sign up to contribute a certain amount per month to help us with production costs and the like, and in return you get rewards ranging from a mention on the Heavy Hands website to a question or topic of your choice being discussed on the show. We have a lot more in the works to reward you for your help, and we appreciate every contribution no amount is too small. Just head over to patreon.com and find how you can help out the only show dedicated to the f- points of face punching. Now let's get back to it. Welcome back, bitches. No, I'm not doing this again. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> welcome back to Heavy Hands. We are talking about another title fight, um, which, uh, okay, Phil, you tried to drag me. You tried to rake me over the coals for this. Yes. Because mm-hmm. I mistakenly said that only Pereira Hill was like pretty easy to call and and not really that rich for analysis. Okay, this one too. Weirdly enough, <laughs> this is actually the biggest letdown of UFC 300. Like they should have had Volkanovski Tapuria for this card, right? Mm-hmm. They they needed a title fight like that. It is weird that the title fights both sort of feel not like afterthoughts, but like we have two recent examples of comparison for just more compelling title fights for both of these champions. Um, 
it just doesn't, it doesn't feel like the, 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 uh, historic kind of title fight that you would hope to see. Something like Gaethje Holloway feels like a historic matchup. Yeah. Uh, something that you just throw together because everybody would love to see it. Uh, the, the best way to describe this one is routine. It's a routine title defense. Yeah. Uh, yeah, both of these kind of feel like, okay, this is you just keeping the belt. I'm happy to see any champion defend the title. But, uh, yeah, that's, that is exactly it. These feel like the, the conveyor belt of the division has fed somebody to the champion. Um, anyway, that champion is Wei Li Zhang. She is fighting Yan Xiaonan. I will say, having just shit all over the matchup, I have been extremely impressed with Yan Xiaonan. Uh, I think she has pretty rapidly gotten much, much better than she was when she started her UFC career some, I don't know, six, seven years ago. Boy, was it really that long? Imagine we've had Yan shown on in the UFC for like seven or eight years. What a prospect. It doesn't, it doesn't feel right, does it? <laughs> um. <laughs> <laughs> shut up, Phil. Shut up. It's a good fight. Um, so yeah, Phil, you're so eager to, uh, to talk about this one. Tell me, what do you think? What? This is bullshit. You <laughs> bailed out of your, uh, of your previous assertions and now you're just throwing me under the bus. Yeah. Um, well, it's, it's one where I think Yan Janan probably has, like, a reasonable, path to success for uh, like minutes of the fight I would say um, because uh, she's quite mobile she's a relatively sharp counter puncher and uh, yeah and uh, Wei Li Zhang still remains you know pretty hittable mm -hmm. and very you know very coachable but has a fairly limited tool set, especially when it comes to opening people up. She really wants to counter, and mostly, like, in order to lead, it's it's going to be, like, uh, sander kicks and stomps and all this other kind of stuff uh, to pull people back into striking with her so that she can counter them. So there is an argument you can have uh, that, like, Jan, who's also, like, big and fairly disciplined... Uh, would just be, will do like what she's tried to do to Jessica Andrade and other people like that in just getting uh, Wei Li Zhang to follow around the cage and just drawing her onto strikes. Uh, the problems with this are obviously that like more technical uh, people than or more skillful people than fighters than Yan have, have tried that, namely uh, Joanna Janjajic, who had to walk through hell against Wei Li Zhang in their first fight and was, you know, on her way out in the second. And more athletic fighters have also done that, uh, attempted to do that. Namely, uh, what's her face who, uh, Amanda Lamos. in her last fight. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, who's less skillful than Janan, but more potent. So, you know, she basically falls on the line between those two. Um, and with the other caveat obviously being that, like, uh, she's a notoriously poor defensive wrestler. It's the wrestling. And, right? yeah. That's yeah. the thing. And that is obviously the part of MMA that, uh, Wei Li Zhang has fallen in love with over the last, you know, couple of fights. Yeah. It has been the key to her success. I mean, that is really it. I, I, I feel like, uh, for as long as these fighters are striking, uh, Jan will be very competitive and possibly will win decent segments of the striking battle. Uh -huh. I think she's just a more principled striker. Um, she's really quite diligent with her jab. I love how much she uses her jab to the body in these last couple fights. Um, she keeps her feet in pretty good position when she's throwing, and when they get out of position, she tends to reset back to range, back to a sound position pretty quickly and gets herself ready to counter, uh, which is exactly how uh, she started fucking up Jessica Andrade, who just, you know, planted her feet and swung four hooks and then ran after her trying to do that again. 
Um, and that happened like two or three times in that very short fight, and, and Yan Chan on won all of those exchanges, including, of course, the one where she knocked her out. Um, I think she's, uh, yeah, not like an amazing boxer, but a pretty good one. She's fast, and she knows how to do certain things that um, Wei Li Zhang, as you said, Phil, has always struggled with, like opening people up, finding... Like there's a there's a tiny little bit of Max Holloway in Yan Shaonan. She knows how uh-huh. to she knows wow. how to Wow. A tiny bit. She knows how to I throw, know what you mean. Yeah, I know what you mean. She knows how to throw combinations. She's not fully committing to every shot she throws. She will throw a feint into the middle of a combination like she feels how an exchange unfolds and she can adjust and is watching for the opponent's reactions. Um I don't think that Wei Li Zhang is that intuitive a striker. I think she's a lot more rote, a lot more tense, a lot more ready to just throw everything into the first layer and then keep throwing as hard as she can. Um, but it's the wrestling. That's it, basically. Yeah. Uh-huh. And not only... I think... Yeah, go on, Miguel. I was just thinking, like... I mean, obviously, Whaley Zhang is... In my opinion, she's pretty much the best that women's MMA has to offer right now. Like, in terms of just real technique, but also physicality, athleticism, and she's she's a delight to watch. She's in really great fights, and she's kind of must-see. And it's, it is, like you said, a little bit sad that this is sort of on the biggest stage. She kind of gets, like, this routine title defense, but I do I do have a little bit of a criticism of Whaley's just the way her sh- striking approach has been put together because it seems like it's not put together in a way that will maximize her physical advantages. Like I, I, th- I think that she is a really intelligent fighter. She wants to work specific setups and responses. So like against Lemos, she really wanted to counter the long rear right hand yeah. of Lemos with a lead left hook. And that's that's sort of like a fine idea. It's like a cool counter, but she never like kind of stopped and asked like, why am I sitting here and fencing with her at range at all? I can literally just like pressure her and and bully her and take her down. And so as the fight went on, she sort of realized I don't need to do that and I don't have to give her this space. So I kind of wish Weili Zhang, given the physical threat that she is, had a style that a striking approach that maximized that. And, and mostly, yeah. I mean, like in terms of pressure, cage cutting. Because my actually my favorite skill set that Zhang has is attacking in transition. Like she's really great. Like she did against Joanna. Like she starts mm-hmm. making you defend grappling, and then she lands her hardest strikes when she can get a hold of you and hit you in transition when you're trying to escape her. That's her making you deal with her physicality. And so, like she can often hold people there with you know like less control, and then have a hand free to really hit them. And because of, like, mechanical issues on the outside, she doesn't actually hit as hard, like, you know, circling and fencing at range as she does when she gets a hold of people. So I feel like this idea of her falling in love with her wrestling is probably a good thing, at least. Yeah. Um, And then mostly, though, like, if she could, like, really develop a style where she was just taking people down against the fence, letting them try to scramble out and just hitting them, attacking them, like... You know, making them deal with their physicality almost a little bit like a Marab sort of style. Like, I, I feel like she could be, like, really awesome. And it's just the fact that she, like, in the second round against Lamo, she, she's just kind of consenting to, like, this, I think it was the second round, this sort of, like, fencing at range. And I just, I can see that happening in this uh-huh. fight, too. And that's that's where I could see Zhao Nan essentially giving some trouble is just because... Zang, uh, Whaley is not that committed to getting to those positions where she's the most dangerous. I, I think, I think for, for, for Zhang, the, the, uh, stylistic issue, like, why doesn't she pressure? Um, maybe technical isn't the right word. Like, she doesn't have the tools. It's a chicken and egg thing, Miguel, is what I'm trying right, to say. Right, yeah, I know what you mean, yeah. She, she doesn't have the tools to be an effective pressure fighter. Uh, like, even the moments when she started pressuring Lamosh more, is more just like using footwork to get close to her, making Lamosh throw, and then countering her. Right, yeah. Um, like, where's the double jab, you know? Like, where's, where, where are the, like, aggressive feints? Where are the, 
like level change combinations to open the opponent up. She doesn't have the tools and it's, it's difficult to say whether that is, it's difficult for her to pressure because she doesn't have those tools or whether she has never gotten comfortable with those tools because she doesn't like to lead. But this is certainly yeah. something that Phil and I have noted many times that like Wei Li Zhang just doesn't really seem to know how to lead. She doesn't like to initiate. Yeah. And I think that's probably exacerbated against people that she thinks are a physical threat. So like against Carla Sparza, she yeah, yeah, sort of yeah. led a lot more, just walked her down and just had essentially no fear. But like you're you're pointing out against Lamosh and uh, Joanna Yonjacek to some extent there too. It's, yeah, yeah. But, you know, you would think that I guess Rose is a bit of a physical threat too, even though she's kind of noodly. She still like has those like that length and um, at least dynamism to give her a little bit of a threat there. But I don't I mean, know. I did, guess she did not it is, out. It's and... hard to criticize her so much because she is clearly a level above a lot of the people in her division. But you would like to see her develop those tools to become like, and, and maybe it is a psychological thing. Maybe it is like, she yeah, just legitimately just, doesn't like to be the person moving forward. I just don't see her as someone who has a real feel for like striking exchanges. I think she 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 knows what her her range is for the most part you know she's super fast and i think when people get into her range she just goes like i think that is most of her counter punching game as well um i mean frankly like yan shanan is a much more sophisticated counter puncher than wei li Zhang, and she is not in fact actually as good as max holloway <laughs> right but she's i think she actually is just more organic she makes more moment to moment adjustments even after the exchange has already started than Wei Li does um, right I just don't think she's very comfortable there Wei Li Wei Li's like and I, you can see that in, in just her over reliance on kicks like when she's on the outside it's yeah. like she's kicking 90% of the time and it's just like she doesn't and, and like you said like she's sort of waiting for people to come in on her and then she'll throw like a bunch of punches yeah. in a row after they get close but she doesn't know how to like get into boxing range with combinations. So I mean, you would love to see her look like somebody like Tapori or something like that Ooh, who knows, right. you know, how to punch his way into range and box uh, in and out of the pocket, you know. Yeah. But the reason Zhang is so good is A, she's an incredible athlete. B, she's very well-rounded. Like none of this is to say that she can't hit people really hard on the feet, that she can't time a counter, that she can't come out on top in an exchange. It's just clearly where she's least comfortable. And uh, I can't recall if I said one, two, or A, B, so I'm going to say C slash three. <laughs> she is... Um, she game plans well. She yeah, and that's she's super coachable. Like, you guys... Uh, probably know Ghost 21 on, on Twitter. He yep. works doing film study for her camp and like the stuff that they're looking at and coming up with for different opponents, just in like what he shares in threads and stuff like that. Yeah. It's clear that they are, they're very, they're looking at stuff and they're trying to figure out how to work around her specific weaknesses. They're trying to develop these tools that are necessary for her. And I think even her relying on getting to that grappling range more in these fights and things like that is a good sign of her like making like, those developments. And she takes it very seriously. So I think, I think we'll see her at the top for a while. Um, sure. At, if she continues to improve like this, but you could see Zhao Nan posing some very specific threats here. If she keeps it basic, if she moves well, if she, like you said, uses her jab. And I think, she, like you said, Zhao Nan is getting better too, especially like the way, like some of her like fundamentals as far as like punching form and stuff like that. Like, I think that's part of the reason why she was able, able to knock out on drive. She's just getting better with her right hand. Like she's just throwing it better. Yeah. yeah. She's, she is somebody who was always very quick. Um, but she, she's, she, she was basically like pre modern era Drew Dober. She didn't right, yeah. seem to have any ability to ground herself or to transfer weight into her shots while also being mobile. Um, and now she seems to have married those uh -huh. two things pretty impressively, right, Phil? Yep. And she's probably like Drew Dober in that 
She's been entirely matched up with strikers and probably still can't wrestle good. <laughs> yeah, that too. Oh man, <laughs> that too. Um, yeah, I mean, I think yeah, Zhang is incredibly coachable, and I think one of the things about that that sort of uh, yeah that that great insight that we get from Ghost Twenty One is that is how tactical it all is. You know, how much of this is you know we know this person likes to do this a punch. And so we trained this duck under takedown. Yep. Uh, you know, we knew we wanted to draw these. Uh, we can draw these strikes out if we double jab in, etc., and so forth. Um, but yeah, not so much in the. I mean, it's, it, that it is that ta- tactical in nature. Kind of um, it tells you what kind of camp you're looking at, right? They are specifically looking at individual granular weaknesses and trying to hone in on them yeah. rather than maybe specifically trying to build you know, yeah, build Wei Zhang into the you know right. a macro level strategic incredible fighter. Which to be honest might not be the best it might not be the best plan because you know when you're at the championship level you cannot afford the dip in effectiveness that you know the Henry Hoof dip in effectiveness that right. comes from retraining someone. It's, you know, it, you cannot afford to have a single off night. And sort of within that context, I do think this this is the fight on the card that has the most chance of being a bit underwhelming for the favorite. Because, as I said, I can see points at which uh, Jean might just be trailing Jan around the cage. Or, like, Jan's actually, she's actually quite good at countering kicks. Yeah. Um, yeah. She's like uh, quite good at like yep. returning low kicks. Uh, generally, like a, a a a decent skill of hers. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you just cannot overlook the fact that she could just get put on her back every single round. And yeah, uh, and that she got TKO'd by Conor Esposa. Yeah, and also yeah. almost armbar herself. <laughs> and yes. almost armbar. I forgot <laughs> of about course. that. Yeah, I forgot about that. Some real Drikus Duplessis style grappling <laughs> there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If it weren't for that, if, if, if Jan were a more, I will say this, and I, and it's actually a mystery that her striking has improved in the way it has, because I'm pretty sure she's been with Team Alpha Male for a minute now. Um, so pro- yeah, she has. probably we can expect some sort of just passive wrestling and grappling improvement, um, as tends to happen to people at that camp. You just get a I mean, lot you of- saw that you saw that against Duran. Like it's yeah, yeah. she was in a lot of bad positions, but you can tell she was put there in camp, so she didn't do the thing that like untrained gra- grapplers do where they right. start to freak out and, and make it worse. Yeah. But I mean the fact that she ever sort of ended up in those positions is bad because <laughs> I posted a clip of this the other day, but there's one point, I think it was in the second round, uh, where Dern got her down, but it was literally like uh like Zhao Nan caught a kick and dro- and threw her to the ground, and then they were like in the center of the cage, and then Dern butt scoots her, oh, like yes. butt scoots at her, like just keeps butt scooting at her, and Zhao Nan backs all the way up to the cage, and then Dern just like crunches up and grabs behind her knee and pulls guard and yeah. ends up there for the rest of the round and almost gets submitted like seven times. She pressured her awesome. into the corner from her ass. Yes. Yeah. Which yeah. That's what. I mean the the amount that Dern was able to just with the worst pressure you've ever seen oh, yeah. get her to the fence. And Dern is just like a terrible like uh wrestler. So it's yeah. no wonder she didn't have success there at all. But she still got her there all the time. So you just kinda have to feel like Whaley's gonna do that pretty easily. Yeah. I, I think it just mm-hmm. I think it just goes to show too that like um these these two are kind of inverse in a in a way where it, it it just speaks to the discomfort of Yan Shanan in the wrestling and grappling. That like when they were on the feet, you know, her footwork her footwork is was better against Andraj and more consistent, granted a much shorter fight. Um against Dern in the striking, the footwork was usually like enough to keep her safe. But then Mackenzie's like on her butt scooting around and she just backs straight up, like the thought process switch from striking yeah. mode to grappling mode forced her to make a terrible, what was essentially a terrible striking decision. 
Cause like just circle. She's sitting down. <laughs> just, <laughs> just walk around her instead of backing straight up. But because, and I think her footwork was also worse even in the purely striking portions of that fight because she was so wary of the grappling. It, 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 it very clearly had an effect. Whereas like against Andrade, again, I think we are seeing, uh, Jan improve and that was part of that. But also like, she wasn't really worried about Andrade grappling her. Not that Andrade can't be dangerous if she gets a hold on you, but like, she's mostly going to come forward swinging, and that's the thing you have to avoid. It might turn into grappling after that. Uh, yeah. but you just have to stop her crashing into you. And she looked really very smooth and controlled and, and difficult to corral, uh, in that fight. So, the fact of the matter is I think this is one of those matchups where the both fighters are weakest in the other's area of strength. But I think Wei Li is able to get by much better in her weak area, uh, mostly by virtue of athleticism and preparation. Yeah. Than Yan Shanan has in the past been able to get by on the ground. Like that fight with Durham was her best grappling performance yet. Because she, like, stayed calm and didn't rush out of bad positions and survived when she needed to. Yeah, the the part that's bad about that, though, is if she gets put in any sort of a similar spot against uh, Wei Li, it's not going to be defending submission. She's going to be right. getting hurt. Right. And that's, like, that's yeah. going to... And that, that was honestly the case with Carla Sparza too. Like, she got yeah. hurt. <laughs> she got beat up by, you know the tiny Carla Sparza yep. from top position. And I mean, it's like the crucifix is also a really bad look. Like Wei Li Zong loves that position. She's really great from there. And yeah, it, it just seems like I don't understand. Even if like it's, if she gets taken down, that's probably, she's probably not going to get up. If she does get, get, get up, she's going to get hit while she's getting up a lot. And there's just going to be a lot of damage that happens in those instances. And it seems like it could be a rinse and repeat for Wei Li just Take her down again, you know? Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. So I think, uh, once again, second title fight, no surprises. We're going to pick the champion to retain. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just say that I, I think the striking portions will stand to be very interesting. Yeah. I agree. But that's not yep. probably what would none of us see, uh, defining the fight. Yep. Okay. Let's take another break then. When we come back, the fight we probably should have talked about first, Dustin Gaethje, <laughs> Max Holloway, and uh, whether or not we have room to squeeze in Charles Oliveira, Armin Sarukian or not, uh, we're going to try to talk about basically all the other big fights on this card uh, for the Heavy Hands Patreon. But at the very least, Gaethje, Holloway after this. Financial support is fantastic, but there are other even easier ways to support Heavy Hands. Perhaps the best is by spreading the word. We know our fan base. You're all cool, popular people with serious as <laughs> your tastemakers and trendsetters. Okay, there are one or two of you that don't fit that description. You know who you are, but no matter what, you can always help us out by telling folks about the show. And you can also give us a positive rating and review on iTunes and Stitcher, things like that. We rely on word of mouth and positive feedback to grow and improve. So thank you very much for your time and your help. Now, back to the show. And welcome back to the first good fight of UFC 300. <laughs> <laughs> Phil, you got up. Miguel and I were talking about this. Like, it feels wrong that we saved. I feel like this is the fight that, like, am I just projecting? This is the one everybody really likes, right? Yeah, for sure. And this one, I mean, Oliveira Tarukin is also, you know, that's a, a number one contenders fight. But but this just uh, gets it. Everyone's something. super emotional over that one. This is the one that everyone can agree is going to be rad and cool and excellent. Yeah, this is just like this is pure MMA. Like this is the uh, the highest level of the stupidest shit that you want to see in this sport. And it seems like I don't know. Everyone agrees. Justin Gaethje. Versus Max Holloway for a completely made up title. Uh, no one cares about that. It's just, hey, remember Holloway Poirier? That was awesome in a borderline disturbing way. Let's do that again. This time against a different one of the 
like big four or big five uh, knockout murderers in the lightweight division. Gaethje Holloway, a very, very exciting fight. Enough double championship fights. I want to see more division hopping just with like perennial divisional staples, you know? Mm -hmm. This I'm cool with. It doesn't have to hold up a, the process of a division feeding challengers to a, to a champion. It's just, uh, hey, would you like to see this fight? Everyone says, yes, I would. And so they make it. I'm down. Um, I think we should start, uh, we should start talking about this maybe by talking about Holloway's last foray into 155. Because it's maybe the only time I have seen Max Holloway just get hurt over and over and over again and not know how to stop it happening. And that does seem like if that's a thing that just happens when he fights a lightweight, especially a hard-hitting lightweight, Gaethje and Poirier both very comparable as power punchers, that seems like a pretty bad a, pr a pretty bad uh, fate uh, that that might have me just picking Justin Gaethje outright. What do you think about that, Miguel? I think one thing is that Holloway did not have a ton of time uh, to prepare for his first four -way, foray into lightweight. So I think he pretty much just, you know, moved up as a featherweight, as the champion, um, didn't cut weight, and just took the fight. Maybe he's uh, tried to adjust that a little bit in this one, but still, it's. I don't think it's necessarily an issue of weight was the reason why he was getting hurt by Poirier. It's just um, Holloway has an insane chin, but he has vulnerabilities, and uh -huh. Poirier was is and is one of the hardest punchers um, in the sport, and like one of the most prolific finishing threats and Gaethje is as well. So there's, there's reason to expect him, like you said, to get hurt in the, in similar ways. But as far as I remember, there's kind of two big ways that Poirier was able to hurt him with the shifting combinations moving in, which uh, Holloway will be vulnerable to because he backs straight up and uh, lacks defense on the back foot. And with uh, counter right hooks as Poirier being the Southpaw, uh, being to whip those into Holloway in the pocket, which is, I mean, I don't know if anybody throws the right hook better than Poirier. No. Uh, but Gaethje has really, really nice hooks. Uh, his left hook is particularly good. Um, he doesn't necessarily have that same southpaw right hook type of thing, but, you know, standing and banging in the pocket um, is definitely something that Gaethje can do as well. But I don't, I don't, I don't know. The, the right hook was a really big deal in that fight. It was so the, it was the shot that surprised him like five times in the first two rounds yeah. against Poirier. Yeah, he just could not see it, that right hook coming. Phil, yeah, it, it's also because it was coming from uh, Holloway's like position of not like safety, but his position of like his win condition, which is that he was backing Poirier up to the fence. Yeah, yeah, and then Poirier was picking off his shots and you know defending them. Uh, like, you know, catching on the elbows, you know, famously, you know, yep. Holloway set off was, you know, he's blocking weird to his corner. You know, he would be getting someone to the place where they're normally toast against him. And he'd be trying to, yeah, throw, throw combinations, like, uh, different levels and so on. And then, you know, he'd be starting, uh, typically at this point, he would be like drawing out stupid things from them and punishing them and then, you know, snowballing. And this is, this is how Max Holloway works. And instead, like, Poirier just sits there, patiently blocks everything, and then will just punch him in the face. Yeah. But I mean, um, Calvin Cater is a big puncher. Not as, uh, not as flexible like strategically as Dustin Poirier, not purely, I think, nearly as good a counter puncher, but Calvin Cater's a big puncher. He hit Max Holloway plenty of times, yeah. particularly when Max Holloway was like going for the kill on him. He would land some really big shots on Max. He didn't hurt Max. Uh, Chancellor Jung, a big puncher. I know it was a very shot version of him that Max Holloway fought, and he certainly like got Max's respect, but he didn't hurt Max. Uh, despite landing big clean shots on him like Borea did. 
I I gotta think it's something like you, you this is a lightweight puncher. I have yeah. to assume that had something to do with it. That I, I mean you wouldn't think too much about that in boxing all the time when people move up divisions. Like even, you know, six pounds or something, you're like, Well, will his power carry up and will be he he'd be able to take the shot. So I definitely think we probably don't appreciate the difference between ten pounds as much as like people do who watch boxing. Yeah. But I think like power is one thing, but Poirier did not win that fight just because he hit harder than Holloway. Of course not. Of a course big, not. Like a big thing about that fight is it's like really one of the only fights other than like the Volkanovsky fights, which are the last one particularly that looked very different that where Holloway was actually outlanded. And so it's kind of crazy to see Poirier in that fight really actually keeping up with the volume of Holloway. That's something Cater could not do at all. Yeah. Like, even though Cater was able to land some big shots, he just did not keep up with the volume. And even still, it got really dicey for Poirier in some spots in that fight when Holloway was hitting him to the body against the fence and stuff like that. So it's even given all of that, his ability to hurt Holloway and to keep up with the volume, to be able to defend things like Phil said, that was a big part of it too. He still, like, had to pull it together for a fifth round to to really like seal a definitive victory. Yeah. It was it was one mm-hmm. of the fights that informed my confidence watching Poirier versus Saint Denis. Mm-hmm. The commentary was like he's getting tired. Yeah. I'm like he's not tired, tired because he looks gassed. I'm like less than two rounds into the Holloway fight, does it just? Yeah. he just keeps. It's a very honestly in that way a Justin Gaethje esque performance, right? Because Justin Gaethje will do his most inefficient shit at the beginning of a fight and get tired. But um, especially now, I think, when that happens, is better than ever at just kind of – he still ha- he can still summon the explosion when he needs it. And I think it's very likely part of the reason that he starts jabbing people late in the fight, <laughs> even though right, yeah, yeah, yeah. convinced it up. could win him fights much more comfortably if he would do it early – it occurs to him later because it's easy to do. Yep. But it makes him very effective, even when he's tired. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I yeah, I picked against Dustin Poirier relatively confidently because I'd seen him in, you know, tough fights. It seems crazy to think of in retrospect. But again, we've sort of said this about um, what's-his-face last week, um, Vicente Luque. Yeah. Is that... You know, you can learn to be a blood and guts action fighter. And Dustin Poirier, you know, he went from being, you know, an action fighter to a guy who can have wars. I mean, we and, have we have yeah, Charles that, that Holloway Ola- fight. We have Charles Oliveira on this card too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, fighters who have learned resilience and uh, you know, that yeah. developed a sense of calm and determination through that tough experience. Right. Yeah. And yeah, the ability to the ability to keep pace, all those like little like mental and physical ticks that he's learned to sort of pull himself back into the fight. Um, yeah, just allowed him to to hang with uh, Holloway, particularly because yeah, like you said, he could keep coming back and hurting him. I guess the one thing I came into this fight trying to figure out is that I wanna I wanted to find a way to avoid my initial gut reaction, which is just that like. Uh, sort of, which is sort of the one that that Connor had, which is yeah. that Holloway got overpowered a little bit in that fight. I think of Holloway as being on the downslope, and I think the version of Justin Gaethje we've seen lately is perhaps the best version of him that we've seen. That Poirier fight, in terms of synthesis, yeah, that yeah. Poirier rematch was the best performance he's ever had. I think across the board, yep. Um, like both of those. Both the Fazeev and the Poirier fights were performances where, like, he clearly had uh, a plan, and yeah, when he's when he got tired, as you said, he got better rather than worse. Also, fights like where he wasn't like winning super convincingly <laughs> either right. one of them. Uh you know, I've still seen people arguing. I, I do think that he won the Fazeev fight, but it's very close. Yeah. Um, and the Poirier fight, you know, you it could just be argued that it's just one giant, giant kick that really wins him that fight. I think in the Poirier um, one, the I, I think I was so impressed because I think he, 
despite the fact that Poirier landed the best, most effective shot of the first round, he had uh-huh. Justin rattle. He hurt his eye. I think he hit him like directly in the eye. Yeah, yeah. That rocked him. I th- still think most of the work in that round, Gaethje, do- Gaethje does most of the better work. He lands a lot of yeah. ni- nice, tidy shots and doesn't get hit clean very often. Yeah, um, I was, I was, yeah, as I said, I was genuinely very impressed. Um, you know, Gaethje's defense is also weird. And in that fight, it was weird too. And I, I could see Holloway in a weird way struggling with it too, because Gaethje does this thing where he covers up and ducks in, a lot. Yeah, and, high kicks. <laughs> yeah, ducking into high kicks even. But, you know, it, it is kind of weird. And Poirier did start to take advantage of that. Like yep. you you mentioned the shots that he was, he was kind of hitting him with, where he was you know, kind of fainting out the duck and then lining up the straight left as a southpaw. So, yep. and it, Poirier tried to get him to duck into the high kicks too. He just has terrible kicking form with no hips on his high kicks. Mm-hmm. Yep. But I, I don't know. I, I, I do kind of think that Gagey's defense obviously leaves a lot to be desired. And it's, he is more so kind of taking the back foot approach recently and he just fires back and he, he throws, especially in the first several rounds, like he throws everything 100%. And then like you see in fights where he is against somebody that's swarming him, like against Oliveira, he kind of gets worse and he just start he yeah. like overthrows to try and get them to back off. And then he's, if, if he swings wildly, it just, that does seem like a spot where Holloway yeah. could find some real success. Cause that's Holloway's favorite thing is to get people you know, swinging at him and for him to just be in the pocket, but be taking angles and be moving around them, changing levels. He throws the rear right hand to the body, comes up, um, up top, gets the guard up, throws to the body again, steps around them. It's like he can do so much work there. It seems like he could work around Gaethje's defensive liabilities if he can hang with him, because the problem is, is like kind of eat some of those gigantic swings. Yeah. Mm-hmm. My yeah, God, this, the this the uh, the Khabib fight. If to, just to talk about Justin Gaethje looking ludicrous overthrowing in the back foot. One of me and Phil's <laughs> favorite fights. The the first ever UFC fight on ice. I believe I said in yep. my my, <laughs> my Substack write up. Uh, yeah, I think Dustin is a much more um subtle, relaxed counter puncher than Gaethje. And because he actually like has his jab there and is not trying to kill somebody with every shot right from the beginning, he he's much harder for a guy like Holloway to overwhelm with all of the feints and pawing jabs and flick jabs and level right. change setups and all of this. I think you're right that that stuff might very well work a lot better against Gaethje, drawing out huge reactions because Gaethje's good at countering people who come in with huge shots. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like Fazeev. Yeah. Uh, not so much, perhaps, somebody like Max Holloway, who, who attacks really intelligently, really will just grab a tiny little piece of initiative and just ride that through a 10 punch combination where you just, you can only play catch up all, every step of the way. I'm sorry, Phil, yeah. you were, Phil, you were saying. Yeah, so this, this dynamic is present in, like, both of Keith G's early UFC losses, right? Um, because the Poirier, the first Poirier fight is Poirier essentially figures that he can make, uh, he can, because, you know, Gaethje has the catch and pitch counters and so on. And that Poirier just figures he can get him to put his guard up and then just pour in offense. Yep. And similarly, like Alvarez does the same thing. Yeah. And he gets the guard up and then he goes to the body. Like, Obviously, like Max Holloway can synthesize these two approaches, right? He can yeah. do both of these things. He, we well know that he can do both of these things. Um, so yeah, I mean, it does feel like one of those ones where should Holloway be able to push Gaethje to the fence like, like Poirier could is, uh, like Holloway is in many ways a, a craftier and more dangerous offensive, uh, fighter than Poirier. Like he, He's takes better less coming risks forward. coming in. He's better coming forward, yes. He's much worse going backwards, no doubt. Yeah. That's really where the difference was in their in <clears throat> in their fight. But, you know, if he can if he can back Gaethje up to the fence, like 
yeah, you can 100% just synthesize those those two approaches, like work the body and then, yeah, just throw away volume and then pull out giant swinging punches. Mm-hmm. I think, for me, the the real crux of the matter is is less the uh, like the size or the power and anything like that. It's more just that I think Max Holloway is kind of shot now, like, right? And because we've had a bunch of fights from him, where I very strong either very you know there's obviously the Alexander Volkanovsky loss where he just got absolutely smoked. But, um, you know, and then the Chan Sung Jung fight where, again, the Korean zombie himself is is super shot. But, like, the Allen and Rodriguez fights were both fights where I quite strongly favoured his... his, uh, Very strongly favoured Max Holloway over his opponent. And then the actual way the fight played out was that it was just a sort of knockdown, drag-out war. Um, Like, he really had to dig deep to beat Yair Rodriguez um, in a way that, like, you know, Volkanovski just didn't. And, like, even Allen, I felt like he won that fight fairly comfortably, but, like, once Allen actually started going after him in that last mm-hmm. round, yeah. once Allen got mad and went for Max Holloway, like, it looked like Holloway was getting buzzed and getting pushed backwards and kind of lost that round. <laughs> yeah. Um... So it, it felt like, you know, Alan was trying to be technical and fence with him and so on, and then lost the fight doing that, because that's Max Holloway, and he's incredibly crafty. But once Alan just went after him, just it just worked. Yeah. Although, do you remember, like, uh, the final seconds of the last round, Alan is just chasing after him crazy and Holloway basically mm-hmm. drops him <laughs> like coming yes. in in a very similar <laughs> way that he did Korean zombie, mm-hmm. you know, like Korean yeah, zombie yeah. also just decided I'm going to go for broke. I think it was the third round. Right. And, yeah, and yeah. he just, he did get to Holloway, but then you kind of see that it's not that Holloway has gotten like awesome off the back foot or any way or really developed the type of like back foot game that Poirier or Gaethje has, but He's just game and he yeah. hits hard too, like harder than you expect. Yeah, yeah. And he's like unkillable still. Like for some reason, he's just unkillable. Yeah. I think maybe his chin is not what it used to be. I oh, definitely not. That, that seems pretty likely. Like Max Holloway's got one of the best chins ever. Um, just the fact that Poirier hurt him 7,000 times and I don't think he dropped him actually once. I think I he just still put- don't think he's ever been dropped, right? I think that Not might be right. Not officially, yeah. Yeah. Um, but it, you, I, I think you see it in him trying to retailer his approach a bit and in maybe responding a little more defensively. Yeah. When he does get touched, that, uh, he's trying not to allow that to keep happening. Whereas before, not that he was just like insisting on being hit, but he didn't really give a fuck if it happened. You yeah. know, like I mean, he's still definitely getting his bell rung. You know, you can see disorientation in the way that he moves. Yeah, uh, much more so than before, where it was just like, yeah, whatever. Right. Yeah. Like the, I mean, the second Jose Aldo fight is just yes, like exactly. nuts. It's like there's nothing Aldo could hit him with that would dissuade him at all. And the last we like even sort of. Kind of, so, well, we did see that was against Cater. Like, he just was totally yeah. undeterred by anything Cater hit him with. And that's the fight where he broke all the records with, you know, strikes thrown and landed. And it just, yeah, maybe, maybe there is something to this, like that after that, um, and it's, and he just kind of hasn't necessarily looked the same in his last four fights. Like, he's never been that, like, uh, snowballing high volume fighter the same way. Like against Yair, mm-hmm. he kind of had to turn to beating him up in the clinch, taking him down a bit. He still punished Yair's like footwork and, yeah, um, for sure. and backing up to the fence and things like that. He did his normal stuff against Yair, but it wasn't the type of overwhelming volume that we had, we all like knew him for in the earlier fights. And yeah. maybe it was like him trying to re- build a style that could beat Volkanovsky because he was never able to do that to Volkanovsky. I think <laughs> like that's definitely part of it. To. That's the, the, his approach in the second Volkanovsky fight is radically different from, yep. um, like I, I was going to say any previous fight, but recall there was also that fight with Frank Edgar. Edgar. Yeah. Edgar. 
Yeah. Which was like a And that of- was after the Poirier fight. So I don't know. Yeah, maybe there is just like this. Also, strength, he had a know. weird fight with like Jeremy Stevens that everybody forgets on his incredible run of wins, which was not really super impressive. Mm-hmm. Like the thing is, Max has always he has always had a few of these, just less. They're not all like the pure Max Holloway avalanche performances. Even in the period of career that was really defining him. Um, but it does feel like there have been a lot more of those since the second fight with Volk, excepting the fight with Cater which is the only one, and is perhaps the greatest classic Max Holloway performance. I mean, fuck, perhaps. It just is. Like, it's one of the yeah, most for sure. incredible, uh, uh, pure Max Holloway fights uh, you could possibly imagine seeing. I mean, st- literally, what was the what was the record from um, from uh, uh, Brandon Royval the other week where I was talking about how he set, like, a strike record, and but also his accuracy was incredibly low? Mm-hmm. But his his like strikes thrown in a fight in a five round fight was like five hundred something, and Max Holloway has him beat by like two hundred and fifty. Yeah, t- seven hundred and forty six <laughs> strikes he threw against Cater. It, there's, it, I don't know if it it might be one of the things that will never be done again. Like that that's and a record. he he landed fifty nine percent of them too. So he landed four hundred and forty seven. Oh, yeah. It says it's it's insane. Yeah, but that is right there after the Volkanovski fight where he tried to change his approach. Um, I didn't think he looked bad against Jair, really. I think Jair is one of those guys who is just a weirdly difficult style matchup for some people. Um, but then it is concerning that, like, yeah, the, the, the third Volk fight, he gets trashed completely. Um, not super aggressive against Arnold Allen. A little more aggressive against Chan Sung Jung, but it still doesn't really feel like what you would have expected, uh, like 2019 Max Holloway to do to Chan Sung Jung, right? Mm-hmm. So I don't know. I'm, I'm not like sold on, uh, whether or not Max Holloway can, is no longer capable of having that kind of performance. Uh, that cater fight was only three years ago. But I definitely, right. I definitely think the, probably the reason we have been seeing more, uh, less avalanche swarming fights is that, I mean, tied to the same reason that he like stopped doing so much hard sparring. And mm-hmm. the fact that he was, I mean, how many years ago now was it now that he was extremely fucked up by his weight cut mm-hmm. and was like slurring on camera and like, honestly, part of me really wishes that Max Holloway had just, after the Poirier fight, had stayed at lightweight and been able to, it wouldn't have happened for him, which is why he probably went, went back, but would have gotten some like tune up fights at 155. I think maybe it would have been a fine division for him. Um, but I gotta assume the weight cut and everything, like he, he just, I just think he's been adapting to the fact that he can't just soak up punishment like he used to be able to. Um, one thing we haven't mentioned yet is is the kicks of Gaethje and, and you know, kind of pointing out mm-hmm. the the stylistic trouble that Yair posed. Right. That's definitely going to be an issue for Holloway. Right. Like, it's not that he – like, his vulnerability to kicks is, is sort of overplayed at times. He is vulnerable to kicks. Yeah. Um, but he is also very active at countering them and finding ways around them. So it's not as easy to just blast kicks into him as you think. And Gaethje can be countered throwing his kicks as well, too, especially naked kicks. Oh, yeah. Um, and he doesn't, I, th- I think Gaethje was a better leg kick when he was a pressure, a leg kick fighter when he was a pressurer, but adding the high kick is really interesting. Yeah. Uh, so that, and that's something that even Allen had success with. So the kicks could be a factor here too. And just Gaethje being able to kind of like rack up damage on the outside. If Holloway is not going to just put, press him to the fence. Yeah. Yeah. That's the other reason why I'm concerned about like the, direction that that Holloway has taken a because I'm I'm just not sure he can like physically hang with these kind of fighters anymore I mean just from a, a trend perspective not necessarily like Connor said from anything that we've actually seen right but it's just that he's not looking great but also like I think he needs to be on Gaethje a lot to win this fight yeah 
Like, I, he's uh, if he's winning this fight, I will be shocked if it is from the back foot. <laughs> I don't think technical Max is the one he needs to he needs for this one. Well, I mean, for exactly the reason that uh, Gaethje was a better low kicker when he was pressuring people, like. A, a kicking game, if that's one of the major concerns, is just much harder to consistently pull off if you're actually being pressured. Right. Gaethje's yeah. found good mm-hmm. ways of throwing them in as like pot shots and sort of fights where he is giving ground and, and moving laterally, but not being swarmed. Like, for example, Charles Oliveira swarmed him. It was much harder for him to get kicks off. In fact, yeah. Oliveira. He was did it good. against Poirier though. He kicked, he kicked at Poirier's legs a good bit. Yeah. But as we mm-hmm. said, Poirier is not as, um, not as good a pressure fighter. Yeah, like Poirier wasn't. Yeah, not not the Oliveira or Khabib pressure for sure. Yeah. He was he was allowing Poirier to come forward, but it's not. Most people don't like really swarm Justin Gaethje when he does that, and when they do, as you said, he he made some hilariously bad decisions against both Khabib and yeah. Chucky Olives. Like despite yeah, the fact not he, just in overthrowing, but also in his footwork. Yeah, yeah, it's like. Yeah, well, and another thing we could probably talk about too is um, just like what it might look like in the clinch because both of these guys are like sneakily good there, but in different ways. Yeah. So it's like I I wonder if there's anything to that. I don't, I don't know. Like talking about the way that their styles have changed, um, maybe we don't see them clinching up that much. But it's something that Holloway has always used as part of his like onslaught. When like even in the Calvin Cater fight, you see him actually just entering the clinch with elbows and beating yep. Cater up that way, or just, you know, he's, he's so diverse with his strikes. So he'll grab, uh, uh, grab collar ties and land knees. And he, he, he did that against the IER a lot too. He's like, I don't know. There's a lot of things that he can do in the clinch and gate and Gaethje as well. will just like find collar ties and, and wing like gigantic punches. He's dangerous there too. So it's like, I wonder if, if it ends up a little bit closer, what it's going to look like there. Yeah. I um I don't know. I I just have this uh like the gut feeling that I led with is that like it's not going to go well for Holloway. I don't think he's as durable. I don't know, but I feel like like Max Holloway doesn't he doesn't lie down <laughs> if you, even no. if you hurt Max yeah. Holloway early or like for example, if you get low kicks off on him, even if it wasn't his game plan to pressure you, he will start doing it because he's not just going to let it keep happening. And he's like, well, I, you, okay, you're getting kicks off of me in range. He did that to Yair. You know, I think he came into the Yair fight thinking he was going to have more of a range fight. And then the Yair started hitting him with the kicks and he was like, nope, sorry. I have to drown you. I can't let that mm-hmm. happen. That's just like the best way to stop that kind of offense from landing. And I really do think that Gaethje is, like, much more vulnerable than he would like to think against people who accept the sort of counter-punching Gaethje gambit, you know? Like, oh, you want to fight on the back I think, Jake, I, I think, to be fair, Gaethje is also very scared of going to the ground. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's that, too. Like, There's that, too. Cause he is constantly against... Uh... Against uh, Khabib and Chucky Lobs, he is constantly just priming himself to throw his hips like ten feet behind him. (laughs) That was an additional secret weapon that they had that allowed them to pressure him so crazily, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I I mean, I would love to see Holloway like press some press his grappling advantage in some way, even if it's like trying to do something in the clinch just to Oh he should just immediately start the fight and then shoot on Gaethje and then just shoot a single right away Gaethje on ice to return. Yeah, I mean (laughs) exactly because just getting him to freak out in that way would I mean it would drastically change the fight. Yeah. Yeah. Shit, maybe that's something Holloway could prepare for the low kicks. Just really practice like knee picking him when he kicks the leg. He took he did take uh yeah, you're down a bunch. Yep. yep, off of those kicks. Uh, and admittedly, it, although admittedly, it is also Yaya Rodriguez. <laughs> right, yeah. True. Gaethje's a bit harder to take down. Yeah, I mean, the fact that like Gaethje got taken down by Michael Chandler and then scrambled midair and caused Chandler to headbutt the floor and nearly knock himself mm-hmm. out. Like, um, But Gaethje's like, you know... He's a he's a little panicky under pressure. Like yeah. he he really gets out of position and he madly overthrows and he doesn't see shots coming when you as I said, you like accept the gambit. 
You want to fight on the back foot? Okay, well, here's what that means. Which is why Gage should jab in round one. Mm-hmm. Much harder yeah. to run him over if he just used the fucking jab. Literally, Trevor Whitman is yelling at him to do it every single fight, and he doesn't do it until the... I already said this on Twitter, and I said it in my Substack piece, but there are three distinct fights in Justin Gaethje's career where he starts dominating his opponent with the jab and does not even think to throw it until the last round of the fight. Against Tony Ferguson, it took him four rounds to start jabbing. And when he did, the jab won the fight. It literally knocked Tony out. Like, that was the last shot. And it set up so many wonderful combinations, and it just ruined Tony's day. And against Fazeev, and against Chandler. Three different fights where he has had this great weapon in his arsenal and just doesn't even think to throw it. He's just, it doesn't matter how much better he gets, um... I just think he's just the violence idiot forever. Like he just wants to do <laughs> unbelievable highlight reel worthy shit. He doesn't mind having a war. I mean, that's why I was so impressed with that Poirier rematch. I thought that was the most like consistently technically responsible Gaethje I've ever seen in round one. Um, but it's just one fight. I don't know if that is because of what it was, if it was just a good night for him, I don't know if that represents like a final evolution of just one Gage. fight. And it's also a rematch. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So yeah, as much as this feels like a, a potentially really rough fight for Max, I, I really do think it could get very, very bad for Justin Gaethje as it goes on. If he starts getting pressured and starts freaking out, I agree with you, Miguel. I think, I think Max hits way harder than people give him credit for. Um, and doesn't even need to hit as hard as someone like Justin Gaethje because he's got so many ways of setting you up and staying right on top of you while you're making all these terrible like positional decisions. Yeah, and Gaethje's one of these guys that it's – I don't know. Like when he gets hurt, um, it's not always because like you know he's getting the lights turned off but just because he's like out of position and getting yeah. stumbled. And so mm-hmm. it's like I, I can definitely see Holloway eating him up. Like the – the shot that Oliveira dropped him with is because, you know, <laughs> Gaethje was just like exiting at, like out of close range and just totally squared up. You want to talk about Jamal Hills? You want to talk shit about Jamal Hills' footwork? Gaethje has his ankles together when exactly, Oliveira yeah. hits him with that shot. Like he's in a horrible position because he's getting pressured so hard. Yeah, um, and if Holloway can get that sort of close range in and out, like forcing him to have to make a lot of movements with his footwork like the where in places where you need to take uh small steps Gaethje often takes huge steps and so like and Holloway is really good at just like making those small steps so if he can like if he can get the battle on those terms then of course like he can really punish Gaethje and stumble him around and really make him look quite bad with his defense and stuff like that too it's just can Holloway fight that type of fight anymore it's We'll see. You know, it's, it's it's hard to know. Well, you know, I said a few months back, I, this I was going to start just making my gut picks more often, um, and it's mostly worked out. You know, but uh, this is the new extreme version of heavy hands, and trusting <laughs> your gut is for pussies. I'm going to trust my balls and pick Max Holloway. I don't care. I think there is a fight here that Max Holloway can win. I think Justin Gaethje is probably the wise pick. But I I really think shit could go very badly for Justin Gaethje if Max Holloway, whether because he planned to or because he gets convinced to by getting hurt and getting his legs chopped to pieces, starts to pressure him. I feel like there is – if you're bad against pressure, there's no worse pressure fighter to just allow – to walk you down than Max Holloway. Yep. Even now, I think that is still the case. And I think he's also the kind of guy who can find he, the reason Max is such a good swarmer is not just because he has great stamina and throws a huge amount of volume. He is such a flexible combination puncher. He has so mm-hmm. many ways of putting hands on you. You know, like there's just dealing, agreeing to deal with Max Holloway's combinations. There's a, the first the first shot he lands on Chan Sung Jung in their fight is a combination which I think is like 
four feints and only one real punch. It's like a pump feint, pawing jab, feints the right hand to the body, and then like a straight left jab to the face, which lands really clean. That's like, that's real combination punching. It's a full combination where you only actually commit to one shot. And you have the guy biting on every single other layer of it. Justin Gagey has never dealt with that. So pick Justin Gagey. It's what I wanted to do when we started the show, but I've decided to give Max the vote of confidence. I hope he wins because I love him dearly. What do you say? Uh, Miguel, you first. You're picking Gagey, Holloway. So, yeah, I'm picking Holloway too. Um, what? No, you've I, doomed <laughs> us. You've doomed us. Right, I, I already, I already <laughs> wrote about this. I did a preview. I picked Holloway in the preview too. It's not, <laughs> it's not a, a reactive thing. Um, I mean, part of it is a little bit of a gut thing. Like, say what you will, but like, I think Holloway is a class above Gaethje. And I think Holloway is un- underratedly an all-time great. Like, he's been oh, no either the number one or number two guy in one of the toughest divisions of the sport, basically since 2016, since he won an interim title, or if not before that. Yep. Which is really almost unheard of, like, in, in this sport. Like, that type of longevity. It, and we don't think about it because he hasn't been the champion in that division, but he really is a special fighter and even declining. I think he's still one of the smartest, uh, fighters. He's, he's hittable. Of course, if his chin holds up, I think that I don't, I don't think that, um, Gaethje can repeat what Poirier did, um, because of the reasons we talked about before. He doesn't have the same defense. He doesn't have the same right hook or, um, positioning or ability to fire back on the fence and probably won't keep up with the volume either. And I don't think that he can play the Volkanovsky game either that Volkanovsky did in the third fight. Cause I think he can jab, but I don't think he has the same ability to play the, um, the hand fighting game and the, like just the movement of Volkanovsky on the back foot is, is way better yeah. than Gaethje. And he's has a way fat, like he's, his jab is really great. His one, two, and the fact that Volkanovsky could compete with him in the clinch as well, um, was a, a big deal from him being able to stop Holloway from getting anything going. So I just don't, I don't see how Gaethje can repeat what past opponents have been able to do. And I think that Holloway will kind of just be a class above. He'll, he'll do the things we talked about. He'll, he'll take advantage of Gaethje's defensive liabilities. I think he'll be sort of woken up into pressure when he gets hit some. And, I mean, it could all change if the weight is too much and the punches and or kicks are just too hard for him at this weight. But also, he's a special fighter. Especially when he's tight. And I, if that Poirier fight is an indication of him finally maturing, like, uh, I am concerned about the fact that Gaethje is actually very, very fast, especially at the beginning of the fight. Yeah. I'm scared. About I mean, because just... that was a big thing for Volkanovski. Yeah, I'm scared about him just blind blindsiding Max with some big shot. Miguel, are you uh do you uh are you a good fight picker? Do you tend to overthink and get everything wrong like I do or uh I am an unwilling fight picker. I pretty much <laughs> oh, don't pick just like fights me. almost ever. That's so just like me. I pick them. <laughs> you know, I only pick them because I have to. All right, so yeah, we're doing exactly. Phil, I hate picking fights. Phil, be wise. Make the pick that my gut wanted me to make. Uh yeah, I'm gonna do that. Okay. Um, <laughs> Somebody's smart. Yeah, like I said, um, I don't think the the direction of Holloway's fights is has been like a good one uh, in terms of how he's been looking. He's been underperforming how I would expect him to win his fights for some time. Like I expected him to beat Allen more easily. I expected him to beat Yair Rodriguez more easily, and. I think I did. We pick him to be, beat Volkanovski. I don't think so, but I can't no, remember. No, but no. anyway, we certainly didn't pick him to get absolutely pantsed. Yeah. Um. So his only uh, like his only fight where he sort of met expectations recently was when he, you know, the ritual sacrifice of Chan Sung Jung. Yeah. Uh, conversely, like Gaethje has been impressing me. Like I thought the Fiziev and Poirier fights both showed a level of maturity and like of control mm-hmm. as much as it is from a, from Justin Gaethje, uh, like that we've never really seen from him before. He's either been, you know, uh, backing up and counterpunching a extremely shot Tony Ferguson, or he's been just having absolutely wild brawls with people. But yep. these, this was like his, his, his best synthesis between the two. 
I think he's trending upwards right now. I think Holloway is trending downwards. I cannot pick Holloway to have a consistent pressure performance against Justin Gaethje. I can't pick him not to get hurt. If he doesn't have a consistent pressure performance, I think he will get his legs chewed up um, on the outside and just isn't, you know, as we've said, like a particularly strong defensive fighter anyway. He's still Max Holloway. I mean, if he gets blown out, I'll still be quite shocked. Mm -hmm. Um, I still think it's going to be an amazing fight. Yeah, I have to pick Justin Gaethje. I would would obviously really like Max Holloway to win. I would... I'm I'm rooting for him. I would like to be wrong. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just in terms of my perceptions of these guys, um, I've been consistently underrating Justin Gaethje in against tough style matchups, and I've been somewhat overrating Max Holloway against quite good style matchups. And yeah, yeah, this doesn't seem. This seems like one that Max Holloway has to fight a very specific fight to win, and I'm just not sure he can do that anymore. All right. Well, like I said, that is what my gut wanted me to uh, to say right when we started. Uh, unlike Miguel, I did not have a fully considered reason to pick Max Holloway. I just decided, eh, let's do it. So... <laughs> <laughs> Either <laughs> that's that's probably a better way to do it. <laughs> that's yeah, that's when I think it's my gut, but it's actually like it's my hind brain just uh, giving me a, a reason I can't quite put my finger on. Um, I'm very very much looking forward to it. All right, that'll do it for this week's episode of Heavy Hands. Thank you all so much for listening. This is not the extreme tone that I <laughs> intended to come into this. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you liked it, but if you didn't. Fuck off. Um, <laughs> thanks uh, thanks for listening. Hope you're looking forward to the event as much as we are. Of course, we will be back next week. Uh, to uh, Phil will get to vicariously uh, or, or sort of uh, he'll get to make fun of Miguel in absentia and lump him in with me if Miguel and I – because I think our only split picks across this whole card, guys, were uh-huh. me and Miguel agreeing about a fight and Phil dissenting. Yeah. <laughs> So you're Ohio gonna get, scum. you're getting dragged, <laughs> you're getting dragged in absentia possibly next week, Miguel. But, uh, Phil and I will be back to talk about UFC 300. It seems absolutely certain that lots of crazy and interesting stuff will happen. So that'll be a great time. We hope, we hope you'll join us again next week. If you want to hear more from this card, if you want to hear us talk about Chucky Olives, Armin Sarukian, uh, Yuri Prochaska, Alexander Rakic, and Calvin Cater, Aljamain Sterling, we discussed all three of those in depth on the Patreon. That's patreon.com slash heavy hands. I would implore you to check out my Substack, The Finer Points of Face Punching, where I published the first of two UFC 300 articles this week, uh, just yesterday morning, by the time you're hearing this, that was called The Barely Controlled Chaos of Justin Gaethje, and I'm also going to have a Max Holloway breakdown coming out before UFC 300, and something cool uh, in the follow-up as well. So, I appreciate your support. Check out my writing at the finer points of face punching. Find us on social media, at Evil Greg Jackson, that's Phil, at Boxing Bush, that's me, at Mig Class, I believe, is Miguel. Yep, that's right. And Miguel, is there anything you've put out recently that you would like people to check out? No, not really. Just follow me on Twitter. You'll see stuff. I'm always writing articles and posting videos and stuff, but the algorithm probably won't want you to see it anyway, so you'll just see all the porn bots and the replies. (laughs) And of course, Miguel, you'll be back with me on the Patreon, I hope, next month. Oh, yeah, please. Let's do some more sumo. That'd be awesome. It went over pretty well. People like sumo, so... Uh, we're more stuff coming for you on the heavy hands patreon until then until all of that if you came here today for the finer points of face punching you came to the right place this has been heavy hands Nuggles like boulders, fists like rocks, bad fight bits like broken clocks, hands like lead, crushing weight, look online, it's always late. Step up down to the show with skills are the key, terrific analysis with the capital T, Connor says he's now brings insight so clean, from those three HBO shows that he's seen, Phil match classy lines, keep the show cohesive, although he wants to turn all fighters into adhesive, so if you're looking for a podcast that gets in your face, then bring yourself down to the heavy
happiest place Where the blowers blow and the slings are just a slip So if you came here for the final points of face punching Then suck my d- That caught me off guard. <laughs> that scared me a little bit. <laughs> Just had to get one last bit of extremeness in there. <laughs> oh, that's a different it's type it. of extreme, really, isn't it? That's a whole different era of extremeness, Phil. You're crossing the stream. I, 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 I just don't care how extreme, what wow. kind of extremeness. Now that's I, extreme. 